Acts this evening. Please open your Bibles to Acts. And please find chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. And I want to read the first five verses and then kind of preach a bit of a topical message again this evening, sort of a follow-up message, or the, the next step message to what we were in uh, last Sunday evening when we looked at the office of the deacon in the church, and we saw last week the benefits of the deacon in the church. Anybody remember what the benefits of uh, being a deacon are? Church grows. I think it's zeal. Okay, church grows and? The zeal. What? Something, something along with the zeal. No, they get great boldness. Yeah, great you get. Yeah. Remember what happened when they when uh, we saw that the office of the deacon, along with the office of the deacon, were these benefits of basically we called it the next step. In other words, God doing taking you to another level, uh, not only of of power but of boldness and of ministry. And I'd like to kind of pick up there this evening. If you'll go with me to Acts chapter... Did I say chapter 7? I said 7, right? Yes. I meant to say chapter 8. So, that was a good good uh, false start. <laughs> false start on the pastor. Penalty of... <laughs> Alright. Acts chapter 8. It's true to form though, right? False start, true to form. Verse 1. It's always consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And uh, then verse 6, And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. All right, let's just go ahead and we'll, we'll ask the Lord's help there. That would be a good point to stop and pray and then to really kind of thread the needle through the, little, the pattern that we see in Acts and moving forward. Father, I just thank you tonight for how clear Scripture is, how on purpose it's penned and written, and I just thank you as well that it's applicable, that we can actually act out what we see in your word. I just pray that you would uh, help us with our understanding this evening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Something I did not mention this morning, but that is a, an announcement and that you folks will be excited about. Uh, we're actually going to have a guest preacher, not this coming Sunday, but the Sunday after. Pastor Jeff Andrews. He's the assistant pastor at Beacon Baptist Church in Jupiter. And uh, Pastor Blaylock's actually the pastor. Most of you would know his name or be more familiar with Pastor Blaylock uh, than his assistant, Pastor Andrews. I'm actually going to be away on that Sunday, and so I've called in a little bit of reinforcement. They're always asking me to go up there and preach, and I figured I'd get them back. <laughs> and so Pastor Andrews, when Pastor Blaylock wants me to preach at Beacon Baptist, uh, Pastor Andrews is usually the guy that calls me and makes the arrangements and so forth. He or Andy Blaylock, Pastor Blaylock's son. And so, anyway, I've asked him to come. He'll be preaching Sunday morning and Sunday evening, May the 6th. And so I hope that you'll be looking forward to that. He's very excited about coming down and uh, having the opportunity to preach. But uh, as I'm preparing the message this evening and talking about deacons, I'm actually thinking of a lot of guys in churches that I kind of see as deacons. This past week I, I met with the assistant pastor at uh, First Baptist Coconut Creek, uh, Matt Morton, right? Is that the kid's name? Matt Morton. They're all kids because they were all students. You know, like my wife taught Matt when he was in fourth grade or fifth grade, sixth grade. She also used to be a sixth grade teacher or whatever. So anyway, but he's the assistant pastor at First Baptist Coconut Creek. And... Um, we were talking this last week about church planting, and uh, you know, I told him, I said, you know, assistant pastors are kind of a New Testament deacon. What brought that conversation up was that he was talking about how that God's kind of placed in him a desire to do more 
than just be assistant pastor. And God's kind of, you know, beginning to burden him and to kind of open his eyes and wonder, you know, what's my next step of, you know, what's God going to do? And that's one of those boldness things that happens when, uh, when you really yield yourself to what God's called you to. And I believe that the closest thing, actually, that we have to a New Testament deacon in the church today is what a lot of times we call an assistant pastor for a couple of reasons that I would say that. I'm not saying a deacon in the average church isn't a legitimate deacon, but most deacons that we know of are bivocational. Most deacons, the job or the calling is not something that this is your life, this is your lifestyle, this is what you do. But the Acts deacon really would have been a full-timer. Literally, the apostles were so busy that they could not manage the distribution for the necessity of the saints. They couldn't do that because they were too busy, and so they had to appoint guys. And if you think about the size of the, of the Jerusalem church, you would easily realize that this is not a you know an evening endeavor or a Saturday or once one Sunday a month that we do the distribution. This is a daily thing. This is a job. This is a business. And that's what a lot of assistant pastors in churches do, actually. They take care of the work aspects of things that so that the pastor can be a preacher and so he can pray. Can I share with you, church, that one of my fondest desires would be to come to the place where I can be a uh, preacher and uh, be about the business of praying? In other words, that would be my vision for our church would be to one day not have to take care of fixing the bus or uh, building things. or And I'm not against doing those things. Actually, as a matter of fact, I kind of have tended to enjoy those things. But I would rather be a better preacher, and I would rather be more effective in prayer and not be distracted with juggling all of the things that are part of the ministry in a smaller church. And so my wife told me last week, she said, you know, you're the deacon in our church. We've got several deacons in our church, I would say. We've got quite a few. But she said, you know, you are the deacon in our church. When something has to get done, you're the one that has to do it. And that's it's not just preaching or praying or whatever. Uh, Pastor, why are you mentioning that? Well, I think we ought to have a very well thought out understanding, a, very, uh, a, a real clarity of the definitions of what a New Testament church is, and then actually to know and form and function uh, how it is in behavior. So last week we saw seven men who were appointed to be deacons, and we just reviewed the benefits of being a deacon. It's really something I think that's along the lines of when uh, Paul said to Timothy, if a man desire the office of a bishop, it's a good work. And so really a deacon would be the same thing. I, uh, I have a problem, I think, with the mindset of an individual wanting power. But deacons, a de the office of a deacon is actually... A, a opportunity to serve. You know, the person who does the work does have power. Isn't it true? I always told people, uh, if you want to paint the walls, then you can, you know, you can talk about the colors of the paint to some degree. My wife has told me, don't tell people that. You know, they might, do, we might come in here sometime and have purple walls, heaven forbid, or something like that. But, uh, <laughs> You know, be careful about that. But the truth of the matter is, there's quite a bit of latitude for the person who does the work, isn't there? In other words, if you want to, uh, if you want to sweep and blow the parking lot, I don't care if you blow it toward the west or toward the east or the north or the south. If you want to blow the parking lot, just go ahead. You know, especially if you use your own blower and your own gas, you can blow it however you like to. You know, if you want to sweep up the leaves or vacuum up the leaves, doesn't make a lot of difference to me. So you kind of have some power there. You know, I want the leaves to be vacuumed. Well, go ahead. As long as you're doing it. But don't tell me which way to blow the parking lot. You understand? What I'm saying? A lot of times we want to boss the deacon. We want to, and uh, so a, a deacon, though, doesn't have the mindset of, you know, I'm going to be in charge. You know, a lot of times I've seen guys that come in and say, well, you know what? I just really, I don't like the direction that the church is going. And I want to make sure that we, well, it may be God's called you and used you in a positive way. I think that a lot of times for a believer to have the Holy Spirit of God, uh, in them and to listen and even to challenge. You know, it's great that I tell people all the time, hey, listen, if something's wrong, tell me. If, if something isn't right, if we need to hear about something, let us know. Sometimes it's just griping. But sometimes it's, this is a good idea. This is a direction that we could go. And so, there is a reason to desire to be a deacon. There's a blessing in it. And uh, for Stephen, it was, you know, getting, getting to preach the gospel with great power and getting rocks thrown at him until he was dead. 
<laughs> That's how it ended up for him. But the reality of it is that look at the way Stephen is mentioned in the Scripture. In other words, a major turn in the trajectory of how the church was in form and function happened when the seven deacons were ordained in Acts chapter 6. Do you see it? In our text, in Acts chapter 8, uh, first of all, Stephen has been stoned to death. Saul has had burned into his memory this picture. The Bible says Saul was consenting unto his death. We know that he held the garments of the young men that threw, uh, that threw the stones, they, or they laid down their clothes at his feet. He guarded the, the garments of the guys that killed Stephen. But Saul is having a the, really probably the first clear testimony of the gospel being preached as a result of Stephen and his death. And of course, the Apostle Paul getting saved, Saul getting saved and being the Apostle Paul, is sort of a pivotal event, wouldn't you say? And the outreach and in the turning of the church to become outward focused and reaching the Gentiles. It's a Jerusalem church at this stage. But now that Stephen has been stoned to death, Saul's conversion is coming down the pipeline. And the first time Saul heard the gospel preached was when Stephen preached it. And so think about this. Sometimes we think that individual events or occurrences in our lives are ineffectual. And truthfully, as far as Stephen's ministry went, yes, he got to be the first one to preach the gospel to Saul, but he never really saw the results. He never really saw what God ultimately did with that. But that's something that stuck with Saul for the rest of his life. And so think about these things. Think about the Holy Spirit, what a wonderful writer he is in showing the development of the church. Acts really is the establishing of the church and the development of the church. And so now we switch to deacon number two. We're going to get him killed off as quickly as we can. <laughs> not, not really. But uh, we go to deacon number two uh, because of the persecution, which really Stephen being stoned would have been the pivotal event in beginning the church persecution in Jerusalem. Except for the apostles, the believers were scattered all about, all around the world. You see that? They were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, which would have surrounded Jerusalem. Now remember Acts 1.8. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria. Now the uttermost part of the earth isn't yet. That's Saul. But Stephen and Philip are the guys that God used to kick off the Judea and Samaria. Here goes Philip. Verse 4, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Now I would like to tie in or connect with you a word for your personal edification in your study. And that's the word preached right here. Uh, this is the word uh, at Caruso, uh, which is uh, used a lot of times in the Scripture, but it is used uniquely in the New Testament as a preaching, declaring the good news or the good tidings, preaching the gospel. Now, I am not an individual that gives too much credence to church history from a secular sense or even from the organized church sense, but I am also not a person who ignores that through uh, there that there has been a continued line of believers in every generation from the Acts church. I, one of the things that you'll find in early church writings by individuals such as Eusebius, but many others, is the use of the word evangelist and the use of the word preach. And it's interesting that Early church writings oftentimes refer to the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as the evangelists. The evangelists. And why is that? Well, because they preach the Gospel. They're Gospel preachers. And so the first four books of the Bible are often called by Christians who wrote uh, about the Scripture. They're called 
the evangelist Matthew or the evangelist Mark or the evangelist Luke or the evangelist John. And I think that that's insightful to help us with the understanding of the word because in the early uh, first and second century, of course, the Greek language would have been greatly used and the way that it would have been understood would have been carried down. Again, I don't give a lot. Uh, I think you can do a good word study in the scripture, but anytime I do a thorough word study, I look at it uh, in ancient Greek and classical Greek and modern Greek. I look at its usage in each of those just to see uh, what the range of meaning can be. And then, of course, the one that I give the greatest, uh, the greatest weight to is how a word is used in the Scripture. It's always interesting to say, okay, well, this word is not a Bible word. This is a language word. And the language was used, so what was understood by the language? Does that make sense to everybody here? Okay, so the evangelist. Uh, in Acts chapter, don't, don't go there, but I just want to read to you verse... Uh, 8 of Acts chapter 21. The Bible says the next day, we that this is Luke writing, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist which was one of the seven. Seven what? Seven what? Well he was an evangelist. Seven what? Deacons. Okay, so he was one of the seven who were ordained for the practical work of the ministry. So Philip was a deacon, he was ordained as a deacon, and he was called an evangelist. Now the word evangelist is a word that simply means gospel preacher, a one who preaches the gospel. And so if you were to label Philip something, uh, you, could, you could call him a fanatic, you could call him a heretic, you could call him an evangelist. That's what he was, he was an evangelist. And there are only three uses of the word evangelist in the New Testament of the Scripture. Actually, there's the one Acts 21a, uh, there's Acts chapter 4, and then there's 1 Timothy chapter 4. So those, those references would be the, the references. We'll look at those momentarily. But I want to look at what Philip did. Verse 5, the Bible says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Now this is significant because if we're going to look at the deacon, we're actually going to have to understand that one of the things that happens when you become a deacon is you also, it seems, become a preacher. He, he, he's not establishing or running or operating the church of Jerusalem. Philip isn't. He's just taking that next step that happens when you really surrender to the work. The work of what? Well, in his case, the work of the deacon. Christian, I want us to understand this because this is so vitally important. Many individuals covet an office or they covet a title or they desire to be something, but the motivation behind it oftentimes is not to serve or to preach. Sometimes the motivation behind it, you know everybody has different motives, don't they? When you say, well, the motive that the people that are doing this is, well, I don't know what everyone's motive actually is. But we can see what the correct motive ought to be. What were the qualifications to be a deacon? Same as the Okay, yeah, the qualifications. What were the qualifications of the congregation when they were to look them out among them? Oh, uh, Men. Honest report. Well, honest report. Full of faith. One wife, full of faith one wife. And power. Oh, those are the qualifications in Timothy. Right. Uh, but when they, were, when they were looked for, they were supposed to be full of faith and power. Oh, okay. Full of faith and power. So you're, you're right. Uh, those, those are listed as qualifications as along with the pastor uh, uh, for an evangelist or specifically for an evangelist. Hey, listen, friend, this is not boring. This is important because a lot of churches just think that church is, is some nebulous word that just exists, you know, in a general sense. But the church actually is non-existent in a general sense. The church is existent really only practically speaking in a local sense. Where does the business of the ministry get done? It gets done in the local church. And so it's important for us to have a good biblical grasp of what a church is and what the makeup of a local church is. And a local church needs to make a lot out of the matter of evangelism. And that's what Philip is doing in Jerusalem, but he's, he's uh, doing something here that is unique because the apostles remained at Jerusalem, but Philip didn't. 
Now, if he's a deacon of the Jerusalem church, what's he doing? Well, this is why oftentimes today itinerant traveling gospel preachers are called evangelists. Uh, many of my evangelist friends take very, very seriously the title. They do. They, they believe that their being evangelist is not merely uh, a random name that's given to a person, but that it is a calling that they have. And uh, it's important for an evangelist to be sent out of a church. Uh, we several times a year have evangelists into our church. This fall we're going to have probably Dustin Duke come and do a teen revival like he did last year. And a gifted evangelist, gifted gospel preacher, I think, uh, and he's out of a local church in Spartanburg, uh, South Carolina. We have in the springtime, usually, evangelist Bill Rice this coming year. We're going to have Will Rice and Bill Rice that will be with us. And uh, they're gifted evangelists, individuals that, uh, that uh, preach the gospel. And we, we use that gift many times, but you may notice that most of them, when they come to town, aren't from here. But here's a question. Does a healthy church have an evangelist? Well, I think so, actually. I think a healthy church does have an evangelist. And that takes us now... Uh, by the way, you know the story of Philip when he went left Samaria. After You see this, this matter of Samaria, the Samarians all getting saved. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4 uh, and just look at a, at a very, very concise, terse command that Paul gave in the midst of a bunch of commands to his protege in the faith or uh, his son in the faith, Timothy. 1 Timothy and uh, chapter 4. Uh, I have to find it. I'm looking for do thou the work or do the work of an evangelist. Maybe I'm in the wrong place. I looked in the whole chapter and didn't see it. No. No, it's in second. So is it, did I get is it second Timothy? Oh yeah, it's written right here in my notes, second Timothy. That's why it didn't work. Hey, listen, true to form, right? False start, false continuation. First Timothy <laughs> chapter four and verse five. Um, well, let's start at verse 2. Preach the Word. Be instant, means ready. In season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work, what is that? Of an evangelist. Notice then, make full proof of thy ministry. Now what would you call Timothy as far as an office goes? I'd call him a pastor, wouldn't you? He's not an apostle. But he's told to be an evangelist. Do the work of an evangelist. And all these other things, preach, sound doctrine, preach it with long suffering, and remember that they're not going to endure sound doctrine, they're going to heap to themselves teachers with itching ears, uh, they're going to get the people that say what they want to hear, but he's told, do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of thy ministry. I believe that one of the measures for full proof of the ministry is the measure of evangelism measure of evangelism. I believe every church ought to be evangelistic, ought to have an evangelist. What's an evangelist? Well, one who declares or preaches the gospel or one who wins the lost. In actual practice, an evangelist is a person who uh, powerfully preaches the gospel. That is, not so much in eloquence of words, but he preaches the gospel in such a way that people's lives effectively are changed by their hearing the gospel, receiving it, and being taught it. And we need this in our church. We need to understand how vitally important it is that we not just preach the Word, 
that we not just preach the gospel, but we actually make full proof of our ministry. Full proof of our ministry. And one of the ways to do that is through evangelism. Now, let me say then that if this is something that's to be done by Timothy, then this is something that's to be done by the church. And it's important for an evangelist to be connected into a church, doing the work of the ministry into the church. Why is that? Well, what good is it for a person to be saved if he's not going to grow? There's a simple answer to that, isn't it? Well, he escapes hell. Right? If a person gets saved and never grows spiritually, he'll go to heaven, won't he? Yeah. So there's good in it, isn't there? But how much of the work of the ministry, how much of the Great Commission is it if an evangelist isn't also a teacher, isn't also an example, isn't also plugged into the same church? And it's really tragic to me that actually today, largely many of the individuals who function as evangelists, no one even knows what church they're connected with. Of course, this person led me to the Lord, so I need to follow up and grow. They usually lead you to them. It's a little bit troublesome, a little bit bothersome to me, actually, that if you go on many evangelist websites, that they do discipleship. You say, Pastor, evangelists ought to do a discipleship. Yeah, they do discipleship without the church. And what kind of a disciple is a person who isn't in the church? What kind of a future is it? See, then you're saved after the order of whatever evangelist. Uh, this would be uh, one of the areas where I've always tried to figure out uh, guys like Billy Graham. What church did Billy Graham push people toward? Whatever they came out of. Whatever they came out of. It's a little problem, isn't it? It's a little problematic. You, you got saved and you're a Catholic. Go back to your Catholic church. You get saved out of an uh, uh, Anglican church, go back to your Anglican church. You get saved out of and uh, whatever you want to list, Episcopalian or Presbyterian or Baptist. Hey, listen, if it's a Baptist church in name only, it's not going to do any good, is it? In a gospel preaching, Bible teaching church. And I think it's important that we as believers understand the connection between the evangelist and the church. First of all, it's important that we understand who the evangelist is. Let's look at one last passage of Scripture about the evangelist, and that's in uh, Ephesians. We go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And I just want to see that the evangelist is a gift to the church. By the way, let me stick my neck out just a little bit and just recommend that the biblical precedent for the evangelist is the root of a local church deacon. Whereas you want to ask, how does a guy get to be an evangelist? I would say in the New Testament, it's pretty clear. Isn't it? How did Philip get to be an evangelist? Was he, uh, oh. he was ordained. He was ordained to be a deacon. And he did the work of an evangelist, right? How did Stephen get to be an evangelist? Same way. The same way. He was ordained to be a deacon, and it was that next step in his life. I am somewhat skeptical about an individual who goes off to be an evangelist without being looked at as a, in his local church as a man full of faith and power and full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Make sense? Of course, I think that's a pretty good standard, isn't it? I know Jesus said a prophet has no honor in his own country, but evangelists ought to have honor in his own church. I've seen many men, pastors and deacons, go into churches upon their own recommendation, but if 
a recommendation or reference had been asked for from the church they left, they probably wouldn't have a good reference. I think that's important to consider. It's an important thing. Matter of fact, it's actually something I look at uh, when we have an evangelist come to our church. I actually kind of look at what are they doing in their church? What are, what's their role or their office in their church? This spring we had Frank Finney come with uh, Dr. Bill Rice and I asked him to speak a couple of times. You know, Frank's a deacon in his church in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And I think that's appropriate. You know, Brother brother Dustin Duke, I believe he's a deacon in his church in Spartanburg. And I just, I think that it's more than simply coincidental that those men seem to have the same kind of power in their life to preach the gospel and that they're taking the same route, the direction that God's taking taken them. Now, I said I'm going to stick my neck out a little bit. There's nowhere in the Bible that says, Thus saith the Lord, if a man be not a deacon, neither shall he be an evangelist. It's not in the Scripture anywhere. Okay, But there's the precedent for this is how these guys became evangelists. And so I think that that's appropriate. Now, let's define evangelist one last time. Because an evangelist is a gospel preacher, and you can preach the gospel. You can be, you can preach the gospel, and you're supposed to preach the gospel no matter what you are, right? Okay, but I think that there is a gift here. I think that there is something special about the evangelist. Verse 11 of Ephesians chapter 4, the Bible says, "And he gave some apostles and some prophets, and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers." for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And it goes on to talk about spiritual growth and uh, being stable and unable to be manipulated in the faith further on. Okay, so we see in this list, though, uh, prophets... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, Whether there be prophets, <clears throat> prophecy, it shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. And then it says, Now we know in part, we prophesy in part, but then shall we know even as also I am known. And it's speaking of the completed Word of God. Many individuals today reject the authority of the Scripture and replace it with the authority of a so-called prophet or apostle. There aren't apostles today. There are, not, there are not prophets today. And so in Ephesians chapter 4, those gifts when Paul wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus, had not been cessation gifts, but they certainly were gifts that uh, were no longer, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that they were, they were fading gifts as the Scripture, as the New Testament of the Scripture was coming into prominence, and even letters like the letter to the church at Ephesus are being penned, then there's not a need for those same truths to be given by supernatural divine inspiration every time. So the Apostle Paul would have taught the things that he wrote to the church at Ephesus, but once the Holy Spirit had written it in a perfect way, that's it. It's, it's permanent. It's permanently given, and it's a, one of those things that God's Word is forever settled in heaven, and so final, it's finalized. Well, in verse, verse uh, 11, the Bible says, after the prophets, it says, and some evangelists. So these are gifts that God gave. And then there's a word that is a um, TSKS, it's Granville Sharp uh, rule, which in the construction that it is here with the, uh, in, with the uh, chi, the conjunction connected by the nominative with the uh, article. The two of them together means that the second one repeats the first one. So teacher is the same as pastor. They're not separate gifts. Pastors and teachers because of the way they're constructed. If it were simply a list, pastor and teacher, but there were no article in front of pastor and article in front of teacher, then they would be separate gifts, but the pastor and teacher are the same gift. So one of the qualifications for a pastor here, grammatically speaking, is to be a teacher. You can't be a pastor if you can't teach. And uh, you know that's... Uh, I, I, we're not preaching about pastors tonight. We may do that, but not this evening. But I want to dial back just a little bit and look at that word evangelist. The Bible says some evangelist. 
Well, what's an evangelist? It's one who preaches the gospel. Euangelizomai, euangelizis, euangelistes. One who preaches the gospel, uh, one who euangelizes, evangelizes. And uh, evangelizes a poor quality alliteration. So a U, is, a U sound in the Greek is changed to a V sound in the English language, evangelist instead of euangelist. Oh. So uh, my you evangelist is the word. So the V for the U uh, because of Old English and so forth. Now, I, that I want to just simply finish up this evening uh, with the explanation that these are for the purpose of perfecting saints. What's the next phrase in verse 12? What? The for the work of the ministry. <laughs> I'd like to tell a lot of evangelists that. Kind of sounds almost like a deacon, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Pastor and evangelist, these are the two in this, in this list that are present day gifts, right? Evangelist and pastor. And what are those two supposed to do? The work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. To all come together or all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect man and in the measure of the stature and fullness of Christ. And so that, my friend, this evening is a look at another ministry of the deacon, which is the work of the evangelist. And I think every local church ought to have one. Or some. Don't you think? Well, let's pray about it. I'm asking God to give us these things in our church or to help to develop these things in us. Where's evangelists come from? Where do you get your evangelist? Somebody in this room, probably. So, there you have it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what we learned this evening. And I ask that you would help to develop these things in us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, you're dismissed.